Now, uh, Justice Ravindra Bhatt, I don't think I need to introduce him, but still I would like to say one or two things about his work. Particularly, uh, he was, of course, the Supreme Court judge before that he was Chief Justice of the Rajasthan High Court and served in Delhi High Court for a very long time. Some of the judgments given by them, uh, particularly uh, one I'm sure students would remember, on the Roche uh, judgment on the IPRs, where despite all the pressures, he held Roche responsible. He said, in public interest, they need to do something about it. So, uh, in relation to access to medicine, the judgment delivered by Justice Butt is, I think, one of the uh, rarest and one of the finest judgments and has created an excellent jurisprudence in public interest. In the patent field, I think public interest, uh, <coughs> the predominance of the public interest is what Justice Butt has actually laid down and it continues to be. I think that time uh, Delhi High Court uh, started handling a lot of intellectual property rights cases. Of course, now because of the uh, appellate body not being there, uh, it is now naturally it is with the uh, Delhi High Court a separate bench is actually looking after the entire jurisprudence uh, or entire work of the IPR. And uh, in that particular uh, area, I think the contribution made at that point of time by Justice Bhatt is, uh, I think something which is, I'm sure uh, Justice Sachar would have uh, liked it because he was also former judge of the Delhi High Court. Apart from that, Justice Bhatt also delivered his judgment on AWS issue in recent times. The right to information uh, act uh, its applicability to the uh, Supreme Court, uh, you know, particularly to the Chief Justice, which was upheld by the court later, also is very important. Actually, it opened up several possibilities. I can go on, uh, but uh, his, uh, you know, work and judgments uh, actually speak to themselves, and also uh, they represent some of the ideas actually uh, held by Justice uh, Rajendra such a, you know, for a long time, uh, and then. Uh, I also wish to uh, welcome the family members of the uh, Justice uh, Sachar here today and I also thank them actually for uh, you know, allowing or for giving us the honor to uh, hold this memorial lecture every year because uh, Justice uh, Sachar actually as you know I am sure more will be uh, done uh, spoken about this issue by my colleague uh, uh, Mr. Sanjay Parekh. But still, one or two things I just would like to say. Uh, Justice uh, Sachar actually uh, started, uh, you know, on, a, on a various issues, including human rights. Also, he went into uh, commercial laws, industrial disputes, and uh, I don't know, all, uh, I mean, I had a, just a look at this area of work. It's immense, almost 50, 60 years of his practice. And, uh, but most of it, he actually uh, was in the area of public interest and then also to public causes. And he, of course, was uh, uh, very instrumental in uh, working with uh, uh, PUCL and uh, related uh, organizations and kept up the human rights uh, issue. Foremost, he was with the United Nations Human Rights Commission, subcommission, and also he contributed uh, to the development of jurisprudence within India. So, for that reason, I remember I, I was part of the executive committee that time in the Indian Society of International Law. We very happily agreed that this memorial lecture should be held in the ISIL every year and it's, uh, and also with a, uh, you know, eminent people, eminent judges coming and actually speaking about it. So, I think we, I wish to uh, welcome and also thank the uh, family members here, uh, you know, who are here today uh, for giving us this opportunity. And uh, also I wish to welcome uh, the President, uh, Praveen Pariki, Senior Advocate of the Supreme Court and President of the uh, Indian Society of International Law uh, for his gracious presence. Of course, he doesn't need any introduction. Also, wish to uh, welcome our uh, colleague and also Senior Advocate of the Supreme Court, Sanjay Pariki, who is also one of the pillars of this uh, uh, memorial lecture he's always been he himself of course uh, been representing or in fact continuing the good work of uh, in that sense uh, I think I welcome uh, Sanjay ji also and uh, of course Secretary General uh, Nanda Singh one of our uh, eminent international lawyers a former member of the International Law Commission President of International Law Commission 
is also here and also taken uh, all efforts to uh, arrange this uh, lecture. And also I welcome all of you, uh, students and also the EC members and also the members, life members of the society uh, with uh, great respect and sincerity. I welcome all of you. Before I rest my case, the topic today is uh, socio-economic uh, rights and state's obligation. I'm sure who else can speak about this other than uh, Justice Ravindra, but I'm sure we are looking forward to hear this. But one point I just want to mention, you know, when I, when I did a study, uh, you know, one of the areas where I did a lot of work in the last 10-15 uh, years is to see how the so Indian Supreme Court is actually looking at international I have written a uh, few articles and uh, we have been working on this area continuously. Uh, one of the articles which I uh, wrote uh, several years ago, uh, we, uh, which we decided to look at from the point of view of survey of Indian cases almost from the 1950s to 19, uh, almost up to 2010. Then we realized that there are three, I mean, I, I mean this was my study, the, then we realized that uh, the, the first 20 years of the Indian Supreme Court or higher judiciary, including high courts, went in to look at some of the problems created post-independence. It could be boundary disputes, it could be river water disputes. There were several disputes which arose and India dealt with it uh, within the court Magan Bai case or several other cases which you, we can refer to where Indian Supreme Court decided to uh, look at international law and international obligations from that point of view. From 1970 to 1990 is the period where, you know, I uh, say if you look at even the survey of Indian um, cases, higher judiciary, this 20 year period, particularly 70 to 90, is the period where you could see a huge amount of, huge number of cases coming on socio-economic rights. Uh, you talked about the uh, Supreme Court uh, at that time, Justice Bhagavati was in the place. Justice Kuljit Singh was there. There are so many judges who actually, uh, who had committed uh, themselves to look at some of the problems faced by the people at that point of time. Uh, why? Because these were these are the time in which India was actually transiting from a, a you know from a country. After 20 years, the next 20 years were actually social, uh, you know, uh, turmoils and problems, developing country related issues economic issues, and then you had covenants coming into place in 1960s, and then several other instruments which were coming into place, and then Supreme Court was responsible. So if you see the number of cases which have come up in the area of socio-economic rights, actually is quite a number of them, actually, in between 70 to 90. Uh, in fact, it has been quite well reported by us in the Indian General of International Institute. But 1990 onwards, with the liberalization, things have really changed. The nature of the socio-economic rights have actually have changed. I'm sure uh, what we are looking at, particularly in the last 10, 15 years, is also something which is uh, with the advent of digital age and social media and things like that. The obligations and uh, the rights and obligations of the people also have changed uh, in relation to socio-economic rights. I'm sure this is one just. Uh, synoptic view which I just want to give you because if you look at the role of judiciary, the role of uh, legislature in actually enacting some of these things are very important. And also what is the state obligation? I think I'm sure this is where uh, we are going to keenly await what uh, Justice Bhatt is going to tell us about this. And then once again I welcome uh, Justice Bhatt and I'm looking forward to this lecture and just welcoming all of you and thank you very much. Now it's my pleasure to invite Shri Sanjay Parikh sir, senior advocate and EC member ISIS to give introductory remarks on Justice Rajendra Sanjay. Good evening. Uh, as you have been told, this is the third Rajendra Sanjay Memorial Lecture. Welcome Justice Sir Sarandar Bhatt, former Chief of the Supreme Court of India, Chief P.H. Parikh, Senior Advocate and President of ISR, Professor B.G. Hegde, Chairperson of Center for International Legal Studies, JNU, Sri Narendra Singh, Secretary General of ISR, Executive Members of ISR, 
members of ISL family, Madhvi ji, UCL members, members of the bar, students, colleagues and friends. You already been told about the earlier two lectures which were delivered by Justice uh, Madan B. Bokur and Justice B. S. Narsimha. And this is the third lecture in continuity. There was a break in between because of the corona pandemic, but now I suppose it will continue and there won't be any break. At this juncture, I would like to thank ISL, its president, Sri P. S. Parikh, Office Bearers and Executive Committee members for including Justice such a memory lecture as a part of its regular annual event to recall Justice Sacha's contribution and commitment to the cause of human rights and civil liberties. The other annual memory lecture that is held in ISL, as you know, is the VK Krishna Menon memory lecture to remember Sri Menon's contribution to the field of international law. <coughs> Though this audience is familiar with Justice Sacha's dedication to the causes of human rights and civil liberties, I think it would be befitting the occasion to remember him and some of his words. Sri Sacha was born in Lahore, present day Pakistan, on the 22nd December 1923. His entire education, including law, took place in Lahore. His father, Sri Bhimsen Sacha, was a freedom fighter and the first Chief Minister of Punjab, immediately after the first general elections took place in their 1952. Later he became Governor of Andhra Pradesh and thereafter High Commissioner for India to Sri Lanka. Sri Bhims and Sachar suffered detention due to his strong opposition in the emergency in 1975. Sri Adinda Sachar had a successful career as an advocate in Punjab High Court. He earned a great name and reputation in the legal profession. He was the president of High Court Bar Association from 1967 to 1968. In 1970, he was elevated as judge of the Delhi High Court. He was the first acting chief justice of Sikkim High Court immediately after the High Court was set up there. He also served in the Rajasthan High Court before finally returning to Delhi High Court. He retired from Delhi High Court as its chief justice in December 1985. During his tenure, he headed a one-man inquiry committee to inquire into air crash in 1973 in which Mohan Kumar Mangalam, the then Union Minister for Steel, had died. In 1977, he chaired the High Power Committee to review the Companies Act and the MRTP Act. These acts were substantially amended, accepting his recommendations. He got international recognition when he was nominated as a member of the UN Subcommission from 1990 to 1994 on the prevention of discrimination and protection of minorities. He also worked with the UN Commission on Human Rights on the right to adequate housing and submitted a report on this issue in Geneva. He was the trustee of Servants of People's Society and Gandhi Smarag Nithi. Sri Sachar actively practiced as a senior advocate in the Supreme Court from 1986 till 2017. Among several important cases he argued included the case relating to mandatory declaration of assets and criminal antecedents of the election candidates, none of the above option in elections, surveillance and phone tapping, and against the amendment in representation of People's Act, removing the domicile requirement in the Rajya Sabha elections. He was closely associated with Dr. Raman Oloya, Jay Prakash Narayan, and Madhuli Me, among several others from an early age. His attachment to the People's Union for Civil Liberties, QCL, of which he was president, <coughs> president from 1986 to 1995, was remarkable. I recall that in public functions, he always preferred to be recognized as a member of UCL rather than a former Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court. He gained national recognition with his report on social, economic, and educational status of the Muslim community in India as the chairperson of a high-level committee. The report emphasized the growing social and economic insecurity and disparity 
that Muslims faced since independence. He was a regular contributor to all current social, political, and legal issues, which invariably appeared in prominent newspapers. He passed away at the age of 94 on 20th April 2018. His son, Sanjeev, Dr. Marthi, and grandchildren survived him. My association with him since his retirement in 1986, for more than three decades, is still vivid in my memory. We worked together on so many cases of public importance. We traveled together as members of the People's Commissions, which was set up to record the testimonies of persons, mostly poor tribals and farmers, on the oppression and exploitation they suffered. We fought many abusive cases on electoral reforms and for the protection and promotion of human and constitutional rights. Though he was extremely humble and polite, but whenever any occasion arose, he emphatically and strongly showed his dissent. He was affectionate and sensitive in human relationships. Our association not only enriched me in diverse ways, in law and otherwise, but gave me a larger perspective on life. It showed me a path that was full of concern for those who suffered inequality, man-made or otherwise, for all that I consider myself blessed. In his autobiography, In Pursuit of Justice, Justice Sachar has narrated many stories and anecdotes. One, of course, is about his refusing to meet Pandit Nehru at breakfast in his youthful days due to some ideological differences. Another instance was about his taking up cases of human rights violations and arrests against the government headed by his father as the chief minister. His father, however, took it objectively and adored his son for being sensitive to such issues. In the book, he narrates another interesting incident. During the emergency, both his father and his brother-in-law, well-known journalist Kuldeep Nair, were arrested. Kuldeep Nair was already lodged in Tihar jail. Coincidentally, she, such as father, was also taken to Tihar jail. Seeing him, Kuldeep Nair thought that his father-in-law had come to inquire about his health and well-being. But he got a shock when such as his father affectionately told him, Beta, dear son, I have come to give you company. <laughs> as a judge of Delhi High Court, he took up many bold stands, one such being questioning of all cases of attempt to commit suicide, pending in different courts, most of the cases being against poor and downtrodden. Later, the Supreme Court affirmed the law on suicide. In public meetings relating to human rights issues, he was always at the forefront. People waited for his arrival in such public meetings. Fondly called Sachadi by the masses, his absence is felt today by everyone, particularly by those who are involved in fighting for the public causes. Late Sri Soli Suraji, while paying homage, rightly said, just as such as fight to preserve the secular fabric of India continued till the day he passed away. With this introduction of Justice Sachar, let me introduce you this evening's speaker, Justice as Ravinder Bhatt. Justice Bhatt was born in 1958 in Mysore. After his education at Kendri Vidyalaya, he did his honors in English literature from Delhi Hindu College and law from campus law center, University of Delhi. He practiced both in the Supreme Court and Delhi High Court and took up labor, service, constitution, education, civil and other cases. He argued many important matters in the Supreme Court. On 16 July 2004, he was appointed as the additional judge of Delhi High Court. He became a permanent judge on 20th of February 2006. After a very successful and enriching tenure in the Delhi High Court, he delivered many important judgments, especially in the field of intellectual property. He took oath as the Chief Justice of Rajasthan High Court on 5th May 2019. On 23rd September 2019, Justice Bhatt became a sitting judge of the Supreme Court. He authored as many as 142 judgments, which I have taken from the internet, the number may vary, maybe more than 142. It is difficult to mention all the important judgments here, but some of the notable judgments include the majority opinion in Suprio, the same sex marriage case. Minority viewing Janhit Abhihan, 
the constitutional amendment providing for e-governance reservation, concurring opinion in Maratha reservation case, and upholding a CST prevention of atrocities act at Pitura Chauhan's case. In this case, Justice Bhatt, in his concurring opinion, regretted that the expression fraternity is a very important contribution actually to the jurisprudence has not been sufficiently articulated as a constitutional value so far. He made an important observation. It is fraternity poignantly <coughs> embedded through the provisions of Part 3, which assures true equality, where the state treats all alike, assures the benefits of growth and prosperity to all, with equal liberties to all, and what is more, which guarantees that every citizen treats every other citizen alike. Emphasizing the importance of the concept of fraternity, you observe, in my opinion, and I am quoting Justice Bhatt, in my opinion, fraternity is as important a facet of the promise of our freedoms as personal liberty and equality is. We are delighted that a person of such Vishan is amongst us to speak on a subject which is very learned in today's context. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I would now like to invite Sri Praveen H. Parit, sir, uh, President ISIL, to deliver the presidential address. <laughs> Honorable Mr. Justice Ravindra Panchi, my colleagues, Professor V.G. Hegde and Mr. Sanjay Pari, Narendra Singh, the Secretary General of Paisa, and my dear friends. And family members, Justice Rajinder uh, Sattar. On behalf of ISI and all, all participants, I would like to welcome Honorable Mr. Justice S. Ravindra Bhatji, former, former Judge of Supreme Court, has been a pioneering force in the socio-economic rights of the students in India. In fact, there is not a single advocate who went that asked whether Justice Ravindra Bhatji <coughs> mentioned and argued the matter and gave a judgment that I was not heard. It's very difficult for a judge to hear everyone and sometimes the person lawyer arguing may not be very relevant also, but there is one judge which I could see, Justice Ravindra Bhatt, allowed everyone to speak, because perhaps also he thought that uh, after hearing someone, maybe I'll change my mind, but that is very good, and it's not very easy. Sometimes the judges have a lot of work and they have time, no, they don't have, and they, they say, all right, now enough is enough, Mr. Parekh, shut, shut up. Believe, <laughs> don't, don't argue, don't repeat. It's all right. The judge is saying they are entitled to say. But here is one judge who was always ready to hear. And he was also very good to listen to the youngsters. In fact, there are young lawyers. The, the men of some of them are very good. In good days, the young lawyers are very good in the law, law colleges, etc. And uh, they sometimes a young lawyer argues well, and sometimes the judge will say, no, 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 no. And if some big men say, they say, yes, yes, you are very good, etc. That, that happened with human beings. I mean, I'm not talking of any ABC. But you have one judge who heard everyone, whether you're a senior, a junior, anyone, he always heard. And of course, he decided what he thought was correct. But at least every lawyer wants to, to be heard. If you don't hear, then they, they say, all right, the judge has not heard me. So God knows if he had heard me, perhaps his decision would have been in my favor. But he did not do anything. And that is, that's right. Sometimes the, even the client who is sitting there, he, he finds that, oh, my, my, I paid so much fee, and this, my lawyer did not argue. Poor chair, he said he could not argue because the judge said, don't allow me to argue. And this, all this goes on. Therefore, it's very, very important. And in any case, at the Justice Court, which always believe, say that, well, I thought initially that I wanted to decide in favor of A. But after hearing the lawyer for B, now I want to decide in favor of the judge. A good judge is always open till he gives his judgment. So that is something which, and, and that can be a better a, a, a 
judge and lawyers as far as the judges are concerned. They are the real judges for the judges. And I'm very happy that he accepted our invitation to present with us. And uh, we'll be, uh, you, you'll of course be hearing in just now. In fact, I have also made a speech, but uh, I'll hand over and I can pass on to people. Now, this is. Uh, I can welcome Professor Igle and uh, Sanjay Parikji because they are part and partial of this, this organization in the executive committee. And Mr. Narendra Singhji is the secretary general after the work upon the ISI. And who are all part and parcel of ISIL, uh, ISI executive <coughs> Today, we gathered on the occasion of the third Justice Rajinder Sajjad Memorial Lecture organized by our society to pay tribute to the remarkable life and his legacy. Justice Sajjad is a great distinguished jurist, social activist, uh, activist and icon of justice in legal as well as social. In the contemporary world, the social, economic, cultural and legal <coughs> landscapes are changing quickly. Now that is absolutely correct. What is, is what was told by the courts or by the people generally in 1950, they could not agree to that in 1960. Then they cannot live. 1970s, there will be something. And, and today, we are in 2024. We, we think that, oh, that what that, that was said then, that was written there, was not correct. It keeps on changing because people also change, and therefore, it is very, very important that. Uh, uh, the, the, in the contemporary, uh, contemporary world, the social, economic, cultural, and legal landscapes are changing quickly. Access, ac accountability, and expectations have all increased as a result of progress, development, and social and human rights are gradually take, uh, taking center stage in the international efforts. The debate over the recognition and protection of socio-economic rights is intensifying locally in this period of rapid change and is starting to take center stage for both people and government. States are expected to fulfill their duties as agents of changes and action by addressing social issues like social services, education, environment, and unemployment. Thus, this is a perfect time to comprehend state obligations and socio-economic rights. Socio-economic rights seek to promote people's <coughs> dignity, autonomy, and welfare by making governments res respons responsible for providing certain basic social goods and services. This could range from schooling, health care, and satisfactory housing to adequate incomes, human um, uh, labor conditions, etc. Through legal rec recognition and accountability mechanism, socio economic rights attempt to guarantee state support and provision of those social goods as a matter of right rather than services. Major human rights instruments like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights along with key treaties such as the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the Convention on Rights of Child recognized and identified <coughs> various socio-economic rights. These obligations of states to respect, protect, and fulfill socio-economic rights within the maximum of their available resources have come to be known as progressive realization, through which inequalities and imbalances can be corrected. These rights, however, have been distinguished from political rights with respect to ideological subject matter, the course, implications of the state and human justice reality. Most early constitutions did not contain provisions guaranteeing these rights and were more concerned with civil and political liberties. It is the Supreme Court of India who has given much more rights to the citizens by interpreting the same constitution. The constitution is same from beginning till now, with some just small corrections. But it has been interpreted by the Supreme Court. Supreme Court says Article 4. What is Article 4? Court will say, Article 4 will this, this, this. Court will say that the government has to do this. Central government, state government, or the municipality, they are even 
what are they supposed to do? And these are the various things which are not written into as the books, not written by parliament, not written by state legislatures. But the Supreme Court, I read this and say this. Many times they have done it something which is, if you go by technical language, it is not there, but they say we will not go by technical language. We want to say, why are you have the constitution? What are you supposed to do? And all that is done by the Supreme Court judges, mainly, of course, the High Court judges also. There are many good, very High Court judges also. They, but ultimately, the final word, version is in the Supreme Court. But that is what our Supreme Court has changed the Constitution. The man who wrote the Constitution in the good old days, in 1950, when we 47 to 50, all that happened, what is the Constitution, etc. They did not know how much good what they are writing will be interpreted by this by the, the judiciary. Now, there is a wide agreement that the state has an obligation to devise policies that will improve the standard of living of all citizens, yet there arises the question of justability of duty. In our country itself, directive principles of state policy, that again the directive principles is in the, our constitution, but it was said that it is a directive, so it's not to be implemented. You can't force, a citizen can't go and say this is what the directive principles are. Then again the Supreme Court by a large number of judgments have said, they said no, no, this is this is direct principle. I can say yes or non-yes, but I will say yes because it will give with the directive principles. The Supreme Court started applying, uh, apply, apply, rely, relying on the directive principles to interpret the constitution. So all this has happened for a long, long time. Certain socio-economic rights have been originally included within the fundamental right to life and through the incorporation of international covenants as well as with courts uh, uh, recognizing the right to education. It is important to discuss the role of the state and the judiciary in upholding their affirmative obligations as guarantors. And the, the many large number of judges and lawyers in the whole world think that your constitution is good and your judiciary is very good. Thank you very much. Now it is a matter of great pleasure and honor for us to have with us Honorable Mr. Justice S. Ravindra Bhatt, former Third Supreme Court of India, to deliver the third Justice Rajinder Sajjar Memorial Lecture on Socio-Economic Rights and State's Obligations. We welcome you, sir. P.H. Parekh, President of ISI, Professor Vinay Hikde, Mr. Sanjay Parekh, Mr. Narendra Singh, Mr. Ms. Madhuri Sachin, friends, ladies and gentlemen. I am really moved and honored to be invited to deliver the Rajinder Sachar Memorial Lecture this year at the Indian Society for International. In his time as a lawyer, judge, activist, and public figure, <coughs> such as self donned several hats. Today and later Sanjay have elaborated many of them. He was a very determined advocate of civil liberties, and that advocacy didn't stop when he became a judge. He continued that kind of advocacy on the bench. He chaired several committees which I think when I described uh, that produced thorough encyclopedic encyclopedic reports on issues like overall of corporate regulations, the Industrial Disputes Act, the Protection of Human Rights Act, and a report on the social, educational, and economic status status of Muslims in India. He also was appointed as a UN Special Rapporteur on the right to adequate housing and headed a mission to investigate housing rights in Kenya. I have several personal anecdotes which just uh, come up to my mind. The first and very fond memory is that soon off the bench, or rather when he was not even when he was a judge, but off the, 
off the dais. And when, when one met him in private gatherings, he would call me by my short name, which is Ravi. And that continued till the end. And he was one of the most liked, loved uh, judges, vastly compassionate. And one never found him wanting in kindness as a judge. I don't remember having heard, ever heard a harsh word as a judge. For juniors, this was the greatest uh, encouragement, the greatest uh, boost word one could ever get. And I also remember very, very poignantly because uh, in 1984, in the aftermath of the Sikh riots, Justice he Sachar was heading a bench. And those days, the rules on PILs were not very clear. But uh, he perhaps, I mean, I, my recollection fails me, perhaps he took so much to cognizance. And the camps had been set up by the government, relief camps had been set up in two, and two places, and they were inadequate. So justice such as Bench was very activist. It was, it was monitoring many of those things. Well, uh, after a few days, or maybe a couple of weeks, things came to a head. The government uh, of the day had uh, other ideas, and uh, I think the Chief Justice also had other ideas. The bench uh, abruptly changed and we noticed that an equally respected judge, but also, uh, but then he was known for his conservative ideas. He was made to sit on justice, on the same bench as Justice Sachar. Justice Sachar continued to leave, but the other judge was also a senior judge and he had his own views. And uh, effectively that put a break on what was happening. So, uh, but then that's how things work, and uh, sometimes they are. But the point was, Justice Sachar was relentless in his quest for justice. Uh, the way I have seen him in PUCL meetings, he was not a founder. PUCL was, I think, founded when he was already a judge. It was founded uh, in, in 1977. <clears throat> but uh, he became quite actively involved. He always uh, stood for the cause of trade unions, of labor, workmen, and uh, let's say the have-nots, the downtrodden. And we were fellow travelers for quite some time. And I remember uh, both Sanjay and I did a lot, a, a, a one seminal case which had a follow-up judgment in the Supreme Court where those Baddi workers, there were about 2,000 workers, 2,500 families had to. The, the, the workers lost their job because of an abrupt Supreme Court judgment which shut down the industry on the ground that they were polluting. So the compensation packages assured by the court was, was very attractive and very good, but somehow there was no implementation. And then one uh, moved applications and we had Sanjay also joining us. We were all allies there and we were able to rest a lot of relief. Now that's thanks to the efforts of people like Mr. <coughs> Sachar who were there and uh, one could always bank on him, one could always turn to him and even as a judge, uh, he is one of the figures that inspired me uh, on the bench. Whatever uh, encomiums I am receiving, maybe Mr. Parekh spoke very flatteringly about me, it's all because of what I learned from people like Mr. Sachar and some other great judges in the Supreme Court who encouraged us and did treat us like uh, novices who tried to draw us out, teach us. So that, that is the kind of culture I come from and one can't forget it. So being asked to speak on this memorial lecture is of great significance to me and I consider it a personal, deep personal honor. In this context of his illustrious legacy, Today's lecture is based on the topic <coughs> Emerging Dimensions of Socio-Economic Rights and Their Progressive Realization. As you are aware, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UDHR, proclaims the inviolability of socio-economic rights. The moral statements expressed in the UDHR were given legal force to, to, through two covenants. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in 1966 and its sister 
Convention, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Right. The ICESCR. The ICESCR guarantees a comprehensive range of substantive rights, including, to name a few, the right to self-determination, equality, the right to work, and just and favorable conditions of work, an adequate standard of living, the right to organize, and the right to education. Each of them very significant. Article 2 of this ICESCR describes the nature of the legal obligations and the manner in which the states should approach the implementation of these rights. States are required to take steps to the maximum of their available resources with a view to achieving progressively the full realization of ICSCR rights by all the appropriate means. The question is, what is progressive realization of socioeconomic rights? Now more than ever, in an era of increasingly global armed conflict, rapidly declining climate security, and increasing threats of misinformation and disinformation around the world. <coughs> Extreme weather events are a likely reality in the coming years, resulting in unforeseeable consequences that will disproportionately impact the developing world. Specifically, we must anticipate, it, anticipate needs, increased challenges to the actualization of these rights, <coughs> such as educational rights, the right to housing, the right to food, and the right to a safe and healthy environment, to name only a few of the obvious ones. While there is still a dichotomy between civil political rights and socio-economic rights, there is a fairly broad consensus today that many aspects of economic, social and cultural rights do not differ from civil and political rights as much as may be traditionally assumed. In my lecture, I will focus on some selected aspects of socio-economic rights that have thus far received less little attention from the international community. Socio-economic rights relate at the fundamental level to conditions of human existence and survival with dignity. This is very important. It is important to appreciate in our analysis that these socio-economic rights are deeply interrelated. For example, adverse impacts on the right to food can have implications for the ICESCR's commitment to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health under Article 12. The Committee on Economic and Social, uh, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, CESCR, recognized the direct and integral linkage between the right to health and the right to food and the freedom from hunger in its general comment number 14. It noted that the right to health is closely related to and dependent upon realization of other human rights as contained in the International Bill of Rights, including the right to food, housing, work, education, human dignity, life, non-discrimination, equality, the prohibition against torture, privacy, access to information, and the freedoms of association, assembly, and movement. These are seamless rights. These are not independent rights. And our Supreme Court recognized this in two important judgments in 1970, 71, in the Bank Nationalization Judgment, and in Menika Gandhi in 1978, where the ninth, Article 19 rights in our Constitution, the right to freedom of speech, the right to freedom of association, the right to move, etc., were held to be seven lamps. The one important thing was that, that, that was said was that there is an interrelatedness. The sheer indivisibility of these rights is important because a right to equality or a right to liberty without dignity is no right. So, most importantly, the committee has emphasized that pursuant to Article 2.1 of the ICESCR, it is particularly incumbent upon states and other actors in a position to assist to provide international assistance and cooperation, especially economic and technical, which enable developing countries to fulfill their core and other obligations. This is a core obligation that must be taken most seriously to enable the progressive realization of socio-economic uh, rights 
as a tangible goal and not merely as an aspirational one. Moving now to some comments on the right to education. This right is crucially relevant across the world. With the rise in authoritarian regimes in several countries, education is increasingly used as a tool for manipulation and indoctrination. In Russia, for example, teaching of the right version of history is now considered a matter of national concern. Threats of misinformation and disinformation are generally proliferating across the world. Concerningly, in the World Economic Forum's 2024 <coughs> Global Risk Report, one of our, our, we were identified as the country with the highest risk of misinformation. It is important in this context to reimagine what education means as a commitment, not just under the Constitution, but also under human rights <coughs> instruments that prescribe socio-economic rights that must be progressively realized. <coughs> Educational rights must be seen as including not only technical aspects of accessibility and availability, but also education that respects individual freedoms, including the freedom to express opinions and freedom from unlawful interference, such as indoctrination. In the aftermath of the Second World War, children's indoctrination directly linked with the freedom of thought opinion and rights was deemed as one of the key causes for the two world wars. The Trivium Preparatoire, both of the ICCPR and ICESCR indicate that the parents' rights in respect of their children's education were included in the human rights treaties as a necessary and natural response to the indoctrination policies of Nazi Germany to avoid the events of the w uh, Second World War from returning. UDHR includes educational aims in Article 21, 26 <coughs> as a safeguard to ensure states would be precluded from using misusing education in a manner which would be detrimental to children's development and peaceful coexistence between nations. The inclusion of the right to education within the UDHR was not motivated by the desire to send every child to school, but also to ensure that the content and quality of education provided will be beneficial to every child's development as a member of the society. Therefore, these rights can be considered in both individual and collective dimensions. The existence of a free society in the collective sense is impossible without free de development of the individual. And this precludes unlawful interference from third parties, including any form of indoctrination. As a social right, it demands an active role of the state in the provision of educational infrastructure, resources, and supervisory powers. But on the other hand, as a liberal right, it delineates the limits of lawful implementation of the obligations of the state in the social dimension. The importance of avoiding malpractices in the delivery of education was also highlighted in another report of the Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights on the writing and teaching of history. The mode and methods of delivery of education, including curricula, should be taken into account in assessing nation states progressive realization of educational rights of pupils. It is now time to move beyond the aspects of accessibility and availability of schooling to the more qualitative aspects of educational rights as intrinsic goals to be achieved in realizing the right to education. <laughs> One last word on this is that today our educational system is, is, has created new barriers. Although we have uh, new technologies, new courses available in institutions of higher learning, and uh, perhaps greater access to these institutions. But some niche institutions are almost, it is impossible to gain entry because of the, the kind of policies which are there, the one-shot attempt which the children get, the, if I may use the word, the so-called merit system by, by which in one, one exam you have to clear, uh, possibly, and if you are not good at that exam, regardless of where you stand in your overall uh, merit or overall performance, you don't get it. 
That is one kind of barrier. The second barrier is even if you do get it, and if you don't belong to an affluent background, regardless of which class or section of society you come from, it may be impossible for you to gain entry. Our institutions of higher learning, especially in the medical, I would even say legal, and of course engineering segments have become unaffordable to the largest mass of people. So only a select few who have access to means, the means to good schools, join good schools, get good coaching, because our parents are positioned in some good city where this coaching is available. Even affluent people in tier two cities may not have the access to that kind of coaching facilities. So they are also at the, they, they are at the, in, in the line, but they are not get, able to get it. But those affluent students also are unable to get it. And I'm not talking about affluent students, I'm talking about good students who are good performers, <coughs> yet are unable to get in because of this sheer increase in fees. It is unaffordable. Medica medical education in the private sector is unaffordable. And this is a, <coughs> a growing demand which society should be uh, putting in the forefront and making the, all rulers in this country accountable to it in some manner. Now, turning to international criminal law, in 2006, Louis Arbour, the then UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, delivered an important speech and asserted that efforts to address past atrocities display a bias towards civil and political rights. She criticized the way these efforts exclude considerations of socio-economic rights and are predicated on the accountability for a small set of past abuses of civil and political rights. This neglect was symptomatic of the fact that these rights continue to be mistaken seen, mistakenly seen as not as entitlements, but merely as aspirational goals whose achievement no one can be held accountable for. This is what our constitution was initially thought to be, part four, but then we soon realized that that's not so. Why is it, a, even the text of it, it's a directive principle. It directs the state to ensure what? The right to education has now become a part of part three, that is it's a fundamental right. But it was part of part four and continues to be because the, these constitution makers realized that in the, in the process of nation building, it is not possible to assure that right and yet that became a direction, that, is, that, that became the conscience of the constitution. It is every successive government, regardless of ideology, to ensure that education to all is the ultimate goal. Likewise, a right to health. So these were all considered aspirational and as Mr. Parikh said, they have virtually many of these rights have moved into part three, either through legislation, through amendments like in Article 21A, or by interpretation. Now coming to the international scene, a closer look at the potential area of overlap between ESCR violations and international crimes reveals that all four groups of war crimes, at least eight of them, the eight of these against humanity and genocide and often do in reality overlap with egregious violations of EC, ESCR. For instance, there is a central relationship between abusive socio-economic and cultural policies and the definition of genocide in international law. The hindrance of humanitarian assistance contaminating water sources and withholding essential and available medication, food or water to individual, individuals under one's control are some examples of conduct that can potentially constitute both ESCR violations and international crimes. The destruction of livelihoods such as by burning victims' homes or by singling out inmates in political prisons for starvation and forced labor can constitute a serious deprivation of fundamental rights for the purpose of a persecution charge. Now, one topic which is of very great contemporary importance and 
also very controversial is the attack on Gaza. Of course, there was a horrific attack by the Hamas, but then the response so far has been so disproportionate that the, even the ICJ was moved to say, of course, it stopped short of saying it is genocide, but it conceded that there are elements of a genocide. And uh, as Indians, we should be proud that our representative, uh, Justice Dambandari, went forward, went ahead to say even that the, there should be immediate stoppage of hostilities. Of course, he was not joined by all his colleagues. Only, I think, one or two kept company. So, the, the point is, these conflicts are happening. What you see in Ukraine is another example. And these conflict areas are there across the world. And the linkage between economic and cultural, uh, economic and socio-economic rights is not often seen, but it's felt by the people. Forcible population movements, which you see today in Gaza, also frequently go hand in hand with ESR violations, particularly forced evictions or deliberately imposed discriminatory measures in the realm of people's access to jobs and livelihoods. In addition, many international crimes not included in the Rome Statute can also have close relationships with socio-economic and cultural abuses. Slavery-related practices or transboundary movement of hazardous wastes being just two examples. EC, ESCR violations can and should be taken more seriously and addressed with, within availability, availability, available accountability mechanisms in the international criminal law. In, in the area of socio-economic rights, in bilateral trade and business treaties, the implementation of ICESCR in international economic law cannot be relegated to the back end of issues of treaty interpretation. And treaty application in world trade law disputes or investor state arbitrations, but rather should operate as an inbuilt constraint for states when bargaining the terms of the international economic agreements. When negotiating international agreements, states should take into account the impact of treaty commitments on states' minimum core obligations how the new treaty will affect the future ability of the state to progressively realize <coughs> socio-economic plans. Now, we have recently had huge tie-ups in, uh, in the G20, the entire set of multilateral instruments or even bilateral instruments were negotiated. Care has been taken that our sovereign rights of taxation are preserved. Now, if you barter away and say that you concede or dilute that, then the multinationals and who enter and trade in India are completely exempt from tax to a certain level. Whereas Indian businessmen who generate em employment here, they continue to pay those taxes. That's just one example. There are several others and I will come to them. The second, a third issue which they should take into account is whether the design of the dispute resolution mechanism in international economic agreement preserves the state's present and future capacity and authority to respect, protect, and facilitate socio-economic rights, including questions of whether there are sufficient voice, voice mechanisms for local communities impacted by trade and investment operations. Current trends in reforming international economic uh, agreements has thus far revealed a kind of policy and accommodation which means that the ICESCR rights are subordinate, they are rather subsumed, or even human rights obligations are subsumed. Agreements that seek, seek to include provisions maintaining compliance with labor and environmental agreements without being together clear about the legal consequences for a forced state that purposely breaches an investment protection standard in order to maintain compliance with such labor or environmental agreement are some of them. It may be inherently futile to rely on a strategy of exposed interpretation by international economic tribunals to implement international human rights law into international economic agreements. <coughs> Thus far, it appears that tribunals have been reluctant to conclude that investors are directly bound by ICESCR. Now, I just want to 
flag one issue which I have kept somewhere else, where I spoke, speak right now. Uh, the connection between trade law conventions and human rights has been noted, but somehow these operate in independent spheres. We have all these human rights conventions which apply across the world to all members of the world community and all the world's populations and citizens. On the other hand, we have WTO trips and a whole lot of trade law uh, rights or rather obligations which nations are expected to follow. Now, the WTO mechanisms are existent, but they have almost collapsed. Like uh, Professor Hegde mentioned, the, the appellate chamber of the WTO is non-functional just because one country, the US, has vetoed its continuation. Now, that means that a lot of uh, multilateral rights which people have, or the limited rights that they have, are now subject to bilateral investment treaty arbitrations. Now, who are these arbitrators? These arbitrators are largely, I won't use any expression which is racist, but they are largely British or UK or Australian lawyers. And these arbitrators and, and the council are a select few. And they tend to interpret not just private international law or private law, they inter tend to inter interpret public international law. There is no one body of law. If you had the WTO chamber or the ICJ, there is one body of law, a kind of jurisprudence which people are aware of. Many of these arbitrations are confidential. The awards are not, cannot be published. And most often we see that very huge human rights implications are completely kept on the side. The con countries concerned are unable to push their arguments. One great example is that of Bolivia. Uh, sorry, this is Venezuela. Venezuela was rich in oil. Uh, there were many, uh, uh, there were many, I think it was, there were, there was a multinational, multi multinational uh, shell. The Shell Corporation, uh, well, some of its activities resulted in an environmental catastrophe in that country. That led to the uh, use of environmental laws in, in that country, in Venezuela. That became the object of bilateral investment treaty obligations of a dispute. Ultimately, that was decided against Venezuela. Those two, three awards came to be enforced in the U.S. courts. And ultimately, you, the, the eventual result was that it was a bankruptcy of Venezuela. Venezuela went into a sovereign debt crisis. Now, one can't use words like imperialism, but this is a kind of trend which we are increasingly walking into. And support for multilateral instruments and institutions now is far more, it's far greater. There is a greater need to emphasize this. And more importantly, it is important for institutions like the ISL to make attempts to establish that linkage between human rights conventions or, 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 or such related conventions with the right to bring these uh, trade law conventions. Otherwise, it, in, this harmonization will never happen. One attempt was made in one major dispute that was called the Canada Generics, where the uh, generics, uh, generic uh, industry, the pharmaceutical sector, was using, uh, was stockpiling. They say that they continue to store some medicines to be used eventually when the patent term ex exhausted. But the WTO panel, the WTO uh, chamber said that this is violative of trips. Attempt was made to say that the right of the European citizens to have access to this cheap, uh, to this medication cheap, at cheap rates would be quicker because if you allow this to be stockpiled, the moment the patent is over, manufacturing can happen. The WTO panel said, said no. But I am glad to say that in the recent past, there is what is known as the white paper packaging 
uh, dispute. So on the one hand, you have the Tobacco Convention, which uh, under which the, all, all countries were under an obligation not to have advertisements of, of brands, and only uh, a section of it was permitted. I think about 15 percent of the packaging was permitted. The rest was to be blank, which is what called the white paper. Now, based on that, there was uh, uh, legislation, I think, in Australia. Now, that became the subject matter of a bilateral investment treaty arbitration. And in that, for the first time, <coughs> an international tribunal said that your right to your right to property, which is your right to trademark, has to be subordinated to the right to public health. So that kind of breach is necessary now more than ever. If you have, have to have access to cheap medicines, to affordable medicines, uh, India has been at the forefront to make available uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals of a new order uh, to its citizens. And yet, some of these barriers prevent it. So we have been at the forefront of what is known as a special device called compulsory licensing. We have used it a couple of times, but other countries have not been able to do it. So when we talk of human rights and social economic rights, invariably what I have not seen is the conflict between these two, or rather not even the conflict, the need to harmonize these two. So when you uphold somebody's right to property, how does it conflict with somebody else's right to live. Now, that is one important aspect. When it comes to the progressive realization of socio-economic rights, national constitutional commitments and national courts have a significant role to play. Social rights provisions in the constitution are part of an enabling legal framework for addressing past injustices and creating a transformed society. Achieving this <coughs> requires courts that are willing to develop jurisprudence which opens up sustained and serious engagement with the qualitative content of socio-economic rights. Giving courts too large a role in the difficult details of things like housing and health care policy cannot remedy the deep inequalities that permeate the most developing societies. An approach premised on courts possessing all the answers on how best to realize these rights can have negative repercussions for democratic transformation. At the same time, courts also have a key role to play in identifying and enforcing accountability for minimum core obligations. Drawn from interpretation of ICESCR, the minimum core concept imposes an unqualified duty on the state to satisfy a defined minimum essential level of benefit for every person. <coughs> the minimum core has been criticized by several scholars as overly rigid, risking closure on broader deliberative and discursive processes for interpreting these rights. It could also undermine the transformative potential of social rights. On the other hand, national courts can transformatively con use this concept of the minimum core as an analytical tool for developing the substantive content of social rights. Several international and comparative methods, including a housing rights decision by the European Committee on Social Rights, provide specific guidance on the contours of such minimum core obligations. In that case, the European Committee mandated policies that promote the provisions of adequate supply of housing for families, <coughs> take the needs of families into account in housing policies, and ensure that they are truly of an adequate standard and include essential services, such as heating and electricity. In the famous Groot Boom decision in South Africa, South Africa has a, a, an interesting provision, I think it's Article 39 or Article 39, which enables the courts to fashion remedies. And there are a set of rights which are socio-economic rights. They are enforceable. So this was a case where a large number of people came and said, we don't have housing. The housing schemes are completely useless. The court went into it, considered the facts, called for committee reports, and decided its orders, orders ordered 
its order provided impetus to reforming the state's overall approach to housing rights, despite delays in actual realization of the rights for the petitioners who had approached it. India has not been far behind. Right from the 1970s and 1980s, the full impact of the directive principles of state policy, which has set out in part four, and spell out the obligation for progressive realization of social justice, incrementally through legislation and state policy have been felt. The early 50s and 60s saw the direction of the state in massive agrarian reforms. This met with some success in a few states, whereas in others, reforms were slow or at a standstill. This agrarian reform led, uh, uh, laws led to social journey. Yesterday's wealthies, wealthy people were divested of their holdings beyond the minimum applicable. Second generation reforms in the 80s and 90s in various states took forward these ideas. Concurrently, the courts in India started insisting that laws are interpreted in the background of or in the context of Part 4 programs. Various aspirational rights, such as the right to livelihood, right to wealth, right to health, right to clean environment, right to education, and so on, acquired prominence. The court's proactive role led to interpretation of laws in a way, such a way that social welfare in employment and labor laws acquired great impetus. The court also started interpreting basic rights of the people, education, public and health, health care, and public health as integral to the right to live, livelihood, food security, etc. These rights in turn led to their enforcement. There is a need for remedies that promote ongoing interactions among the state, civil society, and affected communities. A process that constitutional courts are well suited to stimulate. It is in this realm that an increased commitment to the progressive realization of social economic, social economic rights is crucial. I will conclude with a note on the inherent dichotomy in realizing, realizing socio economic rights. There is a value in the content of socio economic rights being inherently indeterminate. They are for future generations. They don't stand at one place. There is no full stop. So future generations have to articulate, build upon and expand as human progress takes an upward turn across the world. However, it is also necessary now more than ever to move beyond the minimum, mere minimum core obligations to make substantive, collaborative goal commitments towards a more equal, more <coughs> egalitarian, more sustainable future for all that begins and ends with the actual realization of these socio-economic rights. Thank you.
also a process engine for the detailed information on the life and work of Justice Sachin, his commitment to the cause of human rights, for which he worked throughout his long and illustrious career as a judge, also after his retirement. Now, Justice Ravindra Bhatt has touched on a wide range of subjects. Of course, starting with the constitutional mandate and the work of the, high, the sitting court and the high courts in India on how they have interpreted and applied the human rights and how they have expanded and liberally interpreted the human rights provisions of the Constitution, including referring to international conventions and international developments around the world. He referred in detail to the economic, to the covenant on the economic, social and cultural rights on the various aspects of this and the progressive nature of the rights which are covered under this covenant. He referred also to the work of the International Court of Justice how human rights jurisprudence is developing around the world, both at the global level and the regional courts. That is, he also referred to various domestic uh, decisions of other countries, how human rights are affected by different areas, such as trade and investment, labor laws, and many other subject areas, matters. In international criminal law, he referred in particular to the crimes against humanity, which are now included as a crime, a grave crime under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. The adoption of the Rome Statute in itself was a very major development in human rights law. After <coughs> the adoption of the covenants and a number of conventions which had spelled out different aspects or different specific rights enunciated under the covenants, the adoption of the Rome Statute marked a very major step forward because in this states not only recognized that certain acts were not acceptable in the international area, they were to be punished. But even the highest authorities of, in, under the, of a country, high officials, even heads of states and governments could be held accountable for the commission or, the, or for the failure to prevent the commission of these grave crimes which affect the entire mankind as a whole and cannot be said to be limited to any particular country. Something which is even more remarkable is the manner in which the international community responded to the adoption of the Rome Statute. As I mentioned, this is a statute under which leaders of states can be prosecuted and punished. So when we compare this, the speed with which this particular statute entered into force with that of the Law of the Sea Convention. Under the Law of the Sea Convention, states expected a lot of economic benefits through seabed mining, through enhancing the jurisdiction over the exclusive economic zone and its resources. The Law of the Sea Convention took 14 years to receive 60 ratifications and enter into force. The Rome Statute received 60 ratifications in about five years and entered into force. Just see the difference, the seriousness with which the international community accepted this obligation. Now, 
also thank Justice Bhatt for setting a mandate for the Indian Society of International Law when he has charged us with studying the linkages between trade and human rights and economic matters. So I hope that I'm sure that we will take up this area and uh, we will do justice to the mandate which Justice Bhatt has, has given us today. I thank once again Justice Bhatt and all the dignitaries on the dais and the family of, of Justice Sachin for being here. And I would like to just recall that when I joined the society, Indian Society of International Law, I joined in 1978, although I had been coming to the society as a student before that. Justice Sachar was a regular participant at the society's seminars and conferences. He never missed any event. And this was when we were in Sindhya House at that time. Similarly, Justice Bhatt has been a regular visitor to the society. He is a life member and he is a regular participant in several of our programs depending on his availability and he's constantly he's a constant source of encouragement and support for the society. So I thank him for this and I also thank all the participants who are here, the members of the Indian Society of International Law, members of the bar, students and practitioners and in particular I would like to welcome here the students of the Govind Rao Vanjari College of Law, Nagpur who have come here in strength and are present here today with us. So once again, I thank everyone and I think we can close our session here now and everyone is invited for tea in the, in the journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.